Well, good morning. My name is John McKenzie, and I do work here. Man, it's so good. So good to be home. Welcome to all of our campuses, McKinney, Frisco West, all of you watching online, all of us here at East. Man, thank you to the campus pastors. Didn't they do a great job? Man, all, all three of them. Eric at McKinney, Aaron at Frisco West, Robert here at Frisco East. Thank you guys for serving. Thank you guys for uh, speaking the word. I'm excited to dive in. Before I do, I want to just say one thing about this week, Thursday night, 6.30 p.m., right here in this room at Frisco East, our young adult ministry transitions from uh, meeting at West uh, to meeting here at Frisco East. And so if you are in the ages of 18 to 30, I encourage you, this ministry is for you. Um, come, come and try it out, check it out. I invited somebody last week to say, hey, next week they're gonna be at Frisco East. So I'm very excited about that. This Thursday right here at this campus, 6.30, all the campuses coming together. Man, make yourself, you know somebody in that age group, invite them, tell them about it. Uh, we'd be glad to have them excited about that. Now today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, finish uh, next week, but I'm gonna start uh, chapter four today in this series called Life Hacks. Making your life better. Making your life better. And over the last three weeks, here's where we've been in this series, Wisdom and Perspective, week two, we talked about faith and works. Uh, last week, Eric talked about words and wisdom. Today, I wanna talk about pride and humility in chapter four, pride and humility. Um, very excited about today. I'm praying that your hearts are open. The two main themes of this chapter, opposing themes, is number one, pride, and number two, humility. Chapter four, verse six, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He opposes, in other words, he sets himself against those who are proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humility is the life hack of the kingdom of God. Humility, it is what makes your relationship with God better. When we come to him in humility, when we come to him and lay down our will for his will, it is the life hack of God's kingdom. And uh, if you wanna make your life harder, if you wanna make your life really, really difficult, then be prideful, walk in pride. If you wanna make your life really better, then walk in humility. And so I wanna talk about that today. Here's where we're going. I'm gonna give you definitions, my definitions of pride and humility. Then we're gonna talk about pride and I've got three points under pride, and then we're gonna talk about humility. I've got four points under humility. Because I've been gone so long, um, they're giving me an hour to teach, and so I'm very grateful for the, no, I'm kidding, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that long. But I promise you, that's where we're going, and then we'll end with prayer, but I really want you to open your heart and not think about what you hope your husband is hearing, or your wife is hearing, or your kids are hearing. I'm praying that you're gonna listen to what God wants to say to you. What does he wanna to say to you? How, does, how, do you? how do you need to respond to his word today? That's what I'm hoping for you. Let me give you the definitions of pride and humility and then we'll move into the chapter, chapter four. Pride, living life on your terms. Humility, living life on God's terms. Pride is living life on your terms. I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna do what I wanna do, that's pride. Humility is saying I'm gonna live it I'm gonna live my life God's way. I'm gonna do what God wants me to do. I'm gonna be who God wants me to be. I'm gonna go where God wants me to go. I'm not gonna make my plans. I'm gonna ask for his plans. See, that's humility. And those are two opposing themes of this chapter. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna take pride. So pride is the overarching theme for the first part. And we're gonna talk about three things that James talks about in this chapter about pride. And then we'll talk about humility. So underneath pride is number one, unhealthy or evil appetites. Unhealthy or evil appetites. James chapter four, verse one, let's look at it. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. This is in the context of James, not in a, a political context. This is not like with a, a that we can 
but most theologians believe it's not like a, a sword where they kill one another. It's more they're killing one another with their words and with their actions and with things like that, jealousy and envy. That's how they're killing one another. So this is not a political uprising. It's not a really even a theological debate. This is more of how they're treating one another inside the local body. And in the context of James chapter one, as he talks about these unhealthy appetites and actually evil appetites, he's saying, hey, these quarrels and these fights and these evil desires at war within you, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it, and even when you ask, you don't get you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Now, James, when he writes this book, I think he's in a bad mood, right? I think that, I mean, because the whole book is like in your face. The whole book, James, is like confronting and, and, and just really trying to help us. And I tease when I say he's in a bad mood. He's really trying to help us understand how to walk this out and the exact opposite way is with unhealthy or evil appetites. And what this means in the context, he says you're fighting one another, you're jealous from what others have. Isn't this applicable to our lives as we look around, even our own area? Have you ever driven around Frisco or McKinney and you see these huge houses and you go, what do they do for a living? <laughs> right? You wonder what they do. And, and we say that not with a, hey, I'm glad for them, we say that with a snarl, like, man, I wish I had that because I work a lot harder than they do. Or, you know, whatever, right? We think those things. And, and what he's really dealing with, these themes of unhealthy or evil appetites is materialism. Discontent with what we have. We're always looking for that next new. We're always looking for or at, at uh, somebody else. We look at their house or we look at their car or we look at their whatever and we go, man, I, I don't know if they deserve that. I wish I had that. And, and, that, and this is where he's talking about, this is you're, you're unhealthy. And actually you're driven by jealousy, you're driven by impure motives, you are driven by a pleasure-dominated life. All you're seeking is, I just want pleasure, I want everything for me. See, it's self-centered pride. Self-centeredness. I'm not content with what I've been given. I'm not with, content with what I have, and so I want what you have. Because you don't deserve it, I deserve it. And it's pride, it's a way in which we walk in pride. In fact, verse four goes on to say it like this. You adulterers, now this is the feminine in the Greek, which means he's not talking about adulterers with each other, he's talking about adulterers with God. We're the bride of Christ, we're the feminine version of the church with God, and he says, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God, in other words, these unhealthy appetites, these evil motives, impure, materialistic, discontent, pleasure dominated. That's all we think about is, is our next new pleasure. And it's not wrong to have pleasure, it's wrong to be dominated by it. And he says, when you do these things, you're making yourself an enemy with God. I say it again, if you wanna be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Let me make this clear. Not wrong to have things. Not wrong to have good things. Not wrong to have a Harley. Okay? Not wrong. If you tell me it's wrong, I'm gonna rebuke you in the name of the Lord, right? No, it's not wrong, it's, but when those things have you, that's when it becomes unhealthy. When you purchase things that you cannot afford, that's unhealthy. And you're dominated by this, by this appetite for the world rather than dominated by hunger for God. And James says it's just, it's just not right. And you're walking in pride. You're walking in self-centeredness, which is pride. You're walking in, it's all about me, and I want that, and I want this, and it's unhealthy. And actually, it could even be evil. It could even be evil. The second form of pride that he talks about is when you're judgmental. Now, I find this very interesting that James goes here out of this 
out of this whole realm of talking about evil motives and pleasure-dominated life. And then he goes on to say, chapter four, verse 11, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is not to, your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So you, so what right do you have to judge your neighbor? And how many of us, fi- how many of us find ourselves guilty, don't raise your hands, but we see somebody on the street corner and we make a judgment. We see somebody that is, has something, we make a judgment. We see somebody in a sports arena or we see somebody in the political arena, or we see somebody in, in, in whatever arena, and we make a judgment. I do this all the time, and I don't wanna do it. I see other pastors, and I make a judgment. And I think things, and, and, it's, and, Paul, I mean, and James says, man, this is not the right thing to do. Don't talk and criticize each other. In fact, Jesus says it this way in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter seven. He says it this way. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For, if you, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use, in other words, the harshness, the, the standard that you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And then he says this, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you've got a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't even see past the log in your own eye, you hypocrite? First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. See, James is helping us, Jesus laying that foundation of, of, listen, hey, don't be looking at each other in the church and don't be judging one another and, 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 you know, setting yourself above. See, judging is setting yourself above, so I'm superior, so I'm gonna judge you. I'm gonna look down on you. I'm gonna judge everybody. We have people that do this all the time. They come to me in the lobby and they say, you know what your church really needs? You know, you'd be better if you do. And I'm like, okay, who made you pastor? <laughs> who died and made you the king? It's, it's, it's this, I'm gonna be superior and I'm gonna judge everything that you're doing. James says, no, 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 that's Pride. Pride means you're setting yourself above somebody and you're gonna judge them. You see somebody in the street corner and you say, well, they, they, you know, they made that decision. You have no idea their story. We have, I say you, but we have no idea their story. He says, just don't, don't let that be a part of your life because you got, you got some logs in your own eye that you probably need to take care of before you start taking care of somebody else's. And the fine line, listen, the fine line between judgmental and accountability is relationship. The fine line between judging someone and holding someone accountable is relationship. When you are in, a, when you are in close relationship with, with others, I've got some friends in my life. I was just in Mission, Texas last week and preaching at Palm Valley Church I mean, it's, it's, it's just an incredible church and I just had such a great time, but Pastor Rick there, we talked, we had breakfast Saturday morning and, and man, if Rick came to me and says, John, I, I wanna talk to you about something and I come humbly, I'm, I promise you that, I, I've just been praying for you and I see a pattern in your life and I really wanna help you. Can I just tell you, that's accountability. He's not judging me, he's just holding me accountable and he says, I think there's something better. I think there's a better way. Now that's accountability, that's not judgment. But many of us, we're not worried necessarily about the journey that they're on. We just want to judge them. We want to call their sin out and then leave. No accountability comes alongside. Does it make sense? And then many of us judge according to our own personal conviction, not whether or not it's sin or not. I was raised in a church, and I'm so grateful for my church, I really am, but they preached things that were totally, they preached things as sin that were totally wrong. I mean, they were wrong. They were not sin. And when I grew up, I thought certain things were sin. I was like, oh, they're sinners. They're, they're sinning right there. I see them right there. I see them. They're sinning. Because I was told that by my church, and it's like, man, you don't do that. You're, you're sinning. And when I got old enough to read the Bible for myself, I was like, where is that at? It's not there. 
So many of us, we have personal convictions. Maybe your personal convictions is that you don't eat meat. You're a vegetarian. Awesome. Feel sorry for you, but awesome. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. I'm, don't, please don't email. If you, I, I just, I'm totally kidding about that. I think it's awesome that you're taking your body seriously and healthy and all that stuff. I think it's awesome. And I think you should be commended above all other people. To be, no, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but when, that's a personal conviction though. Does that make sense to you? That's a personal conviction. If you wanna not eat meat, great. But then don't judge your neighbor because eat meat. Don't look down on them and say, well, you're gonna eat that? And it's like, well, yeah, I am. And I'm gonna enjoy it. <laughs> or if you eat meat and somebody else doesn't, you're like, you're weird. You know, can't you, this is America. You know? I know that's a silly, that's a silly thing, but what I'm just saying is, the point is, when you walk in judgmentalism, you are setting yourself superior, which is pride. And any form of pride, God opposes. Any form of pride, God opposes. So if you think you're cool, if you think you're spiritually up here, you, just by very virtue of you saying that, by very nature of you saying that, you're walking in pride and you're not up there. You're actually down here. That's just the way it is. And, and so, so when, when thinking about pride, this evil or unhealthy appetites that we indulge in, you gotta be careful for that, of that. And then this judgmentalism, you gotta be careful for that, of that. Third thing that we find is self-confidence. And this is an interesting one at the very end of the chapter where Paul, James says it like this. Look here, you who say today or tomorrow we're gonna go to a certain town and we will stay there a year and then when we do that, we're gonna have business and we're gonna make a profit. And then James says, well, how do you know? How do you know what your life is like? I mean, how do you know what your life is gonna be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. You can't say those things. What you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. My mom growing up had a saying, if, the, if it's the Lord's will. And it was like, it almost felt like a Jesus juke. You know, you know what a Jesus juke is? When somebody says something, you just come back with a spiritual answer and make them feel small. You know, I'm gonna go over there. Well, the Lord's will. I'm like, oh, yes, if it's the Lord's will. But it was really right. If it's the Lord's will. Lord willing. And that became a catchphrase, but it is really true. And he says, what you ought to say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and we'll do this or that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans. And all such boasting is what? It's pride. It's evil. It's just, it's just understanding that, you know what? You don't make a decision without asking the Lord. If you're in business and you have the, you have the ability to, to make decisions in business, if I were you, I would never make a decision without bathing that in prayer. I would never move across the country, move my family across the country just to make more money. I would only do that if the Lord told us, if he confirmed it, and I really felt a peace about it. That, that's, this is what I'm saying. Those are pretentious plans that I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna make more money. Well, how do you know? You gotta pray about those things and, and bring them before the Lord. That's why I think it's really important that you're not taking your life for granted. It's here today, gone tomorrow. You don't make your plans just according to your own pretentious plans. You make them according to the Lord. And you say, Lord, I'm just so grateful for everything that you've done for me, and I see an opportunity over here, but I'm not sure. I wanna bathe that in prayer. I want you to know that I surrender. I submit to you. I'm not walking in self-confidence. I'm walking in your confidence, and so I want you to help me make this decision. You don't make a decision about marriage. You don't make a decision to marry somebody unless you've really, really prayed about it. You don't make a decision to divorce unless, number one, you have a biblical reason to divorce. Number two, you even if you do have a biblical reason, you pray. And you say, Lord, I'm not gonna make my plans. I'm gonna surrender to your plans. What do you want me to do? It's why I pray over every meal. I know that many of us, that's not even a part of our whole life, it's not really, and I don't say that to judge you, I just say that the reason I do is just because I just think, besides a, 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 the, that's the way I was raised, 
I just think it's the right thing to do to say, Lord, I don't presume about this food. Because you know that we have a, we're so blessed in this country, we throw away more food than most of the world eats. And I think it's really important for us to say thank you, Lord, for providing. Don't take it for granted that you can provide it. You say, Lord, thank you for producing the wealth that, that I have the ability to go out to eat at 100,000 different choices right in a five-mile radius here in this area, right? I mean, it's crazy. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. We have 22,000 places that you can choose from in Frisco. No, I'm kidding. I don't know how many it is, but it feels like that. So self-confidence. So let me ask you some questions as it relates to pride. Here we go. We've got to hurry. What is, what is it that dominates your appetite? Success? Money? Lust for something? Nothing wrong with success. Nothing wrong with money. But when it dominates you, there's something wrong with it. It becomes an unhealthy or an evil appetite. And you've got you've to surrender that to the Lord. That's pride. Number two, how often do you find yourself judging those around you? And number three, to what extent is prayer a part of your plans? It needs to be. I'm saying this to help you. I'm saying this to help me, but I'm saying this to help all of us. This, these are good questions. And, and if you can align yourself out of the unhealthy appetites and out of the judgmentalism and out of the self-confidence and pretentious plans, you're gonna begin to walk on the right road of, of humility. So that's the second. That's pride. Well, let's look at humility and what does James say about humility? Well, the first thing is, is number one, to surrender to God. Chapter four, verse seven. So humble yourselves before God. Humble yourselves before God. What does that mean? Matthew seven, when Jesus taught us to pray, he says this, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May whose kingdom? Your, that's surrender. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, not mine. Romans 12, one. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you and let, them, let, let your bodies be a living sacrifice. And what does this mean? It just means surrendering your decisions, surrendering your will, surrendering your gifts, surrendering your time, surrendering your resources, saying, God, all the amount of money that I have, it comes from you. Every good gift comes from the Father of life. All that I have is, is yours. I surrender it to you. What do you want me to do with it? I surrender my life. I surrender my time. I surrender my resources. At least I'm gonna try to do that every day. It's not a, not a one-time thing. It's an all-the-time thing. It's a way of life. Surrender. And then the second thing is resist the devil. Same, same verse. He says, then humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Resist the devil. Fight against him. In chapter four, the same chapter, verse four, here's what he says. You adulterers don't realize, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you wanna be a friend of the world, make, you make yourself an enemy of God. What do you think the scriptures mean when they say that the spirit of God, the spirit God has placed within, the Holy Spirit within us is filled with envy? It's filled with envy when our appetites are for other things. But he gives us, when we surrender and we resist the devil, he gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires. When we move towards the Lord he, and resist the devil, he gives us more and more grace, more and more strength. Let me, let me put it on the screen like this. The closer you get to God, the further away from the enemy you will be. Doesn't mean the enemy doesn't attack, but the further, the further you'll be away from the enemy when you move toward him, which brings me to number three, and that's draw close to God. I mean, just draw close to God. Chapter uh, four, verse eight, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I was meeting with somebody this week, young adult, and uh, he just texted me and said, hey, could we meet? And I said, yeah, let's, let's do that. And so he came in. I had no idea what this meeting was about, no idea. And, uh, you know, expecting the worst. And, and, he, and he just said, well, I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, 
I just want to make sure I'm hearing God. I, I, I come to church and I hear the messages and it's really good and I really get it, but I, just, I don't know that I'm hearing God and I want to make sure I'm hearing God. And I was like, is that what you wanted? Because <laughs> usually it's emergency. Usually it's something bad. Usually it's something like, man, I got a problem and I need to solve it. He was like, man, I just want to hear God. I'm like, oh, okay. Then I readjusted my gears and said, God, give me wisdom. And I said, time in. And he said, what? I said, you want to hear God. It's not rocket science. It's not a secret sauce. It's just time in. Time in these three things. Prayer. The word, community. You want to hear God? Pray. You want to hear God? Many of us are looking for, we want a word from God. Read his word. Just read his word. You want a word from God? Get into his word. Many of us want to be zapped. We just want God to zap us. Give me a word. Let somebody from across the room come over to where I am and give me a word. And they can do that. I believe in that. I believe that people can do that. The Holy Spirit gives gifts and that can happen. But why don't you just read his word? I said, how long has it been since you read the word? He said, it's been a couple of years. And I said, oh, well, that could be a problem. <laughs> you, want to, you, you want to get close to God. You want to draw near to him. He draws near to you. How do you do that? The, 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 the million dollar question is, how do I draw close to God? Prayer, the word, and then there are other things. I could, I, there's a whole list that I could give you, but these are the three, big, for me, these are the three big ones. You spend time talking to God, and I said, how are you doing with that? He goes, man, I talk, I pray every day. I said, really, you do? Yeah, I, every day I get up, and I, when I go to sleep, I pray. I said, God, what? I said, man, that's good. How often do you read your word? I haven't read it in two years. I said, okay. Well, you've got to listen to it, get it on, the, get it on your phone, and, and you know, get it through your system in the car and, and start listening to it, or you've got to start reading it, or do both, but I promise you this, it will change your life because his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. His word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between what we want and what God wants, soul and spirit. Do you see, what, you see how this works? I mean, you, I mean that, that's really, really, really powerful. And then community, you get into a community and I say, man, you gotta be in young adults next week. You got, you've got to get into community and you've got to start, you know, forming yourself, forming the people around you that were gonna push you towards God rather than pull you away from him. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. How many times have I said that? I mean, it's just over and over, but it is so true. You are who you hang around. These three things, time in. How do you draw close to God? Time in. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a guy and you're a middle-aged guy, and you're doing your job, and you're just kind of thinking, maybe like my friend who was just thinking, man, I don't ever hear God. I don't really, I don't, I mean, I go to church, and I do those things, but I don't really hear God. He doesn't really say, speak to me and say, hey, do this or that. And I just want to propose to you probably the reason. It's not because you don't love him. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's not because he can't use you. It's not because you're so sinful that he could never use you and just, just kind of ignores you and overlooks you like the last on the team, you know, when you're in a recess, and you're picking teams, and you're, and you're the last. That's how some of us view God looking at us. It's like, okay, I'll take him. You know, no, no, it's not the way he looks at you. He wants to use you, but you gotta position yourself to draw close to him, and then he draws close to you. Time in, whew, he's right there. He is not running from you. He's not playing tag. You draw close to him, he draws close to you. This is walking in humility. Surrender to God, humble yourself before God, resist the devil, draw close to God, and then number four, repentance. I get asked about this a lot. John, I mean, is it necessary to repent all the time? I mean, yeah, there are many sins that we're never gonna remember, and do we have to repent for all of those? Let me give the answer in a minute, but let me read the scripture first about what James says about this. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Do you ever find yourself divided in your loyalty between you and between the world and God, between what you want and what God wants? He says, if you find yourself in that position, he's talking to believers here. 
And he's saying, hey, you gotta purify your hearts, guys. Your, your loyalty has become divided. You've, you've, a, you've grown accustomed to the way of the world. You're living in North Dallas, and you are growing accustomed. You're like a chameleon that's changing colors. I've got something else for you, but you are blending into the to the culture, and I'm calling you out of the culture, not in a weird way, but in a healthy way. And he says, man, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. When you're divided in your loyalty, when you're walking in the path of sin, there should be tears for, for this. There's like, oh Lord, I don't wanna walk this way. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter. And gloom, well, what does this mean? In other words, you're not saying, well, well, you know, Jesus has died on the cross so I can just do what I want and there's always forgiveness. That's the wrong way to live. In fact, Paul tells us that in Romans 6. He said, yeah, you don't sin because there's grace. There's grace because you sin, but you don't sin because there's grace. In other words, there's not some kind of big license. And he says, when you do, there should be this, there should be this repentance. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. The highest form of humility is repentance. So Melissa and I, next Wednesday, will be married 31 years. And in that 31 years, I can tell you that it has not been always easy for her. (laughs) I'm an only child, and that brings a lot of selfishness with it. And she had two younger brothers, and she has her own weird ways. And so it's not easy for me either, right? So it goes both ways. But could you imagine in, over the last 31 years if I had never said to her, I'm sorry? Could you imagine if I had never said one time, hey, babe, would you, would you forgive me? If she had never come to me and said, babe, I'm sorry. What kind of relationship is that? Now, am I gonna forgive her if she doesn't? Yeah. Yeah, probably, unless it's something kind of crazy. Then I'll have to think about it. (laughs) But I could never imagine, I could never imagine my kids, a relationship with my kids and looking at them and never saying to them, I'm sorry. I've had to do that so many times. I've had to do that so many times to say, Maddie, I'm so sorry. Dad got mad and I, I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that or Cassidy or whoever it is. I couldn't imagine a relationship where you never humble yourself to say sorry. When you walk in that kind of pride, you're you're walking in opposition to God. He opposes the proud. And I couldn't think of being in my marriage without ever saying to Melissa, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Or her saying that to me. It's the same with God. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then what's next? Any good Catholics out there? (laughs) Forgive, right? Isn't that the next word? Forgive us. Let me answer the question. There's no way that you're going to think of every sin that you've ever committed. And the good news, the gospel is that Jesus pays for our sins, past, present, and future. You can't repent for all your sins. But the ones that we do know, we're not trying to do penance, by the way. All the penalty of sin was paid for by Jesus. We cannot pay for that. So we're not in some penance. This whole thing James is saying, you know, be gloomy and, 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 and tears for what you've done. That's not penance. That's not trying to get made right with God because you're sad. No, it's saying, God, I really want what's best for me. I really want what you want for my life. And I'm just so sorry that I fall short. I don't wanna do that. I, I wanna do what's right. I wanna be who you want me to be. See, that's the humility side of this, that when you walk in that humility, God honors you. He uplifts you. He says, come here. When my kids do something wrong and they've come to me and they said, Dad, I'm sorry, not because they knew they were getting it, right? Not because they were caught, but they come to me and they go, man, I'm just so sorry. I'm just, I, you know what I do? I don't go, well, get in your room and I'll think about it. Maybe you were raised that way, but man, I just can't come here, come here. 
I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you for admitting that. Let's, let's move on. Let's do better. That's what God is with us. He wants us on his team. He wants to pick you first. But he finds himself in opposition when we walk in the pride of unhealthy appetites, of judgmentalism and self-confidence, pretentious plans. He just opposes that. But when we walk in surrender to him, and when we walk in resisting the enemy, and when we walk in drawing near to him, and we walk in a lifestyle of repentance, the highest form of humility, guys, we got a shot. We got a shot at walking in the blessings of God because you're, you're walking in humility and he honors that. He up, uplifts that. So here's where we end the chapter. There's one more verse. There's one more verse. In case you were just kind of thinking, eh, it's a good message, but I'm just gonna kind of do what I do. 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. If the Lord's convicting you today and you don't say, Lord, I don't wanna do this, I wanna walk toward you. I wanna be who you want me to be. I don't wanna make my plans. I want you to make my plans. That's the right thing. To know what to do and then not do it to you and to me, it's sin. Don't continue walking that way in opposition to God. You want God to be for you, not against you. So here's what I wanna do. Those of you who, who find our, those of us who find ourselves walking in this pride in some form or fashion, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit of time. I'm gonna walk off the stage here and I'm just gonna give you like 45 seconds to maybe in a minute of just time with God. And I just want you by yourself, don't be looking at your husband saying, hey, I hope you're praying right now because you got a lot to cover with this. No, I don't want you to do that. I just want, what is God saying and speaking to you? What is he speaking to you? Don't look at your kids. Don't be the superior. God, what are you speaking to me? What are you speaking to me right now? Because I tell you, nobody gets hit harder with a message in this room than me. I'm working on this all week. And as I work on it, I'm like, oh man, I gotta teach this? It's hard to live it, much less teach it. I gotta talk about not wanting materialistic things and letting letting that dominate you? Man, I I gotta do the same thing you do. So no one one in this room is exempt. But I wanna give you 45 seconds across all of our campuses. I just want you to stay, stay in, time in right now and respond to what the Lord is speaking to you. Let's pray.